All right, this PowerPoint presentation will correlate with Chapter 5 in the Explorations textbook or Chapter 6 in the Essentials textbook. This chapter will focus on primate classification and taxonomy. Let's talk about first the characteristics, both physical and behavioral characteristics, that will help us identify a primate, essentially what separates us from the other mammals. Um, the three big ones are arboreal adaptation, which is talking about the suite of physical characteristics that enable primates to live successfully in the trees. Dietary plasticity is focusing on a diet's flexibility and adapting to a given environment. Some primates will specialize in certain food types, like folivivores will focus on just vegetation, frugivores will focus on fruits, gumivores will focus on tree gums, and then omnivores are eating more of a variety of all of those things. So primates are unique in the sense that they have the ability to switch dietary food sources in times of shortages that makes them more flexible and more adaptable in an environment with a variety of food types. Parental investment, all primates in comparison to other mammals will invest a great deal of time and energy into their offspring's survival and for their benefit. So dietary plasticity is referring to the flexibility in a primate's diet. Primates in general eat a very varied diet. Some will focus in, like I mentioned, folivivores will focus in on foliage or vegetation. Frugivores will focus in on predominantly fruits. Insectivores and fo will focus in on eating insects. And omnivores essentially eat a variety of all those things, foliage, fruit, insects, nuts, and even a little bit of meat. Parental investment, primates in comparison to other, other mammals are going to invest a great deal in a few offspring. So they are what we call K-selected instead of R-selected, meaning that in general, they tend to have single births. There are some exceptions. Twin births are common in some species of primates. Um, but in general, most primate species have single births and they space out their births at least two to three years. So they're investing a great deal in a few offspring instead of having many offspring at a time. Um, investment in each offspring is high, and development period, especially for the apes, is going to be much longer. So they're very dependent upon their parents for survival. All right, other characteristics. So when you see ancestral trait, that's an older trait. So ancestral traits are generally those traits that encompass the vast majority of the primate order. And derived traits are more are newer traits. So think ancestral old, derived newer. So primates have a flexible generalized limb structure that allows for various forms of locomotion. That term locomotion means movement. So some primates will be arboreal quadrupeds, meaning that they're moving on all fours through the trees. Some are terrestrial quadrupeds, meaning that they move on all fours predominantly on the ground. Some will be brachiators, meaning that they're using their arms to swing from branch to branch. Some will be vertical clingers and leapers, meaning that they're essentially jumping off their back legs and then grabbing onto branches with their forelimbs. And some will be bipedal. Um, that is, bipedalism is something that identifies predominantly humans and our ancestors. However, some primates can be bipedal for short periods of time, especially the apes, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, can generally walk bipedally for, for short periods of time. Uh, prehensile, pre that term prehensile just means grasping abilities, so primates have prehensile hands and feet. They have retention of five digits on all hands and feet. They have an opposable thumb and big toe. Humans and our ancestors have lost the opposable big toe, the hallux, since we are predominantly bipedal. We use our big toe to kind of springboard off. Um, nails instead of claws. Uh, tactile pads that are enriched with sensory fibers at the ends of all digits. So essentially your finger, your fingerprints and your toe tip, tips, when you rub those together, everybody rub your fingers together, those fingerprints actually serve the purpose of, of, of enhancing our sensory functions. So we're able to take in more information about the environment from our fingertips and toe tips. Um, that is, as a primate, we tend to focus more on the sense of vision and touch. Of course, we do still have hearing and smell, but we focus in more on sight and touch in comparison with the other mammals. 
Primates are predominantly diurnal. That term diurnal means we spend most of our active time during the day. There's a few exceptions. There are, there are some of the streps or hinds, some lemurs um, that are going to be nocturnal, but in the vast majority of the primate order is diurnal. Primates have color vision, enhanced depth perception, also stereoscopic vision. That's the ability to perceive objects in 3D. So all of those traits, color vision, depth perception, stereoscopic vision, those enhance our arboreal adaptations. Depth perception obviously is very important if you're thinking about swinging and jumping through tree branches where you may be very high off the ground. Obviously you wanna be very certain where that next branch is. Primates also have an extended, expanded neocortex. The neocor neocortex is the portion of the brain where information is from the different senses, sight, touch, smelling, sound, you take in all that information and the neocortex processes that information and combines those senses. Also primates have expanded regions of the brain that are related to motor and sensory functions. Primates have a prolonged gestation period, so that goes along with our parental investment. We tend to invest a great deal in a few offspring and we tend to space out our births. And along with that we have reduced number of offspring. So having one birth every two to three years, delayed maturation, just meaning that primate infants and juveniles are very dependent upon their parents for longer periods of time, greater dependence on flexible learned behaviors. So that's culture and um, culture and material culture, which we'll learn more about actually in, in the next chapter. Primates have a tendency to live in social groups and also a tendency towards diurnal activities. So that one's a repeat there. All right, so geographically speaking, of course, you know, with the exception of zoos, if we're looking at where primates originate naturally, the prosimians, also known as the streps or hinds, are going to be found in Madagascar and also parts of Africa uh, and also a few in, in Asia as well. So the prosimians, you'll see lemurs are found exclusively in Madagascar, bush babies, Central Africa, and then the, the lorises are found in Southeast Asia. The New World Monkeys, so New World Monkeys, if you think of the Americas as being the New World, Africa and Asia as being the Old World, the New World Monkeys are found in South and Central America. Old World Monkeys, which are going to include the Circopithecoids, baboons, macaques, colobuses, langurs, guenons, and mangabees. So the Old World Monkeys are found in Africa and Asia. The apes, both lesser and greater apes, are found in Africa and Asia. The lesser apes are the gibbons and the siamangs, and then great apes include orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. And depending upon who you're talking to, some would consider humans to be the fifth great ape. All right, so how do we classify primates? So primatologists look at both genetic and anatomical features in order to classify. So we know from DNA analysis that humans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos are more closely related to one another than either is to orangutans. So what that means is humans are genetically closer to chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas than a chimpanzee is to an orangutan, for example. And chimpanzees and humans are more closely related to each other than is a gorilla. And DNA analysis or genetic classification will provide a different window to the relationships between primates from anatomical classification. So we can, of course, look at the physical features that make us similar or different, but actually being able to map and look at the genome gives us even more information. All right, so now let's talk about how we're dividing the primate order. So this chapter does have a lot of details about physical and behavioral characteristics. So with check-in assignment number four, we will, be, we will be practicing how to classify those characteristics and what characteristic goes along with each, with each primate division. So the two main suborders are streps or hinds and haplorines. So you may also see this called prosimians and anthropoids. So I just don't want it to confuse you. Uh, I know these are big long words. It is helpful to try to say them out loud. So feel free to say them out loud with me as we go through this PowerPoint. So the two primary suborders are streps or hinds and haplorines. So physical characteristics in comparison with the haplorines, streps or hinds have a relatively smaller brain size. They do not have post-orbital closure. We'll talk more about that here in a moment when we have a picture to look at. 
Their orbits, their eye sockets are slightly lateral facing. Lateral means to the side. They have a moist rhinarium, which is the wet nose. They have a tooth comb, which is a dental feature in the lower jaw that's it's going to be a grooming adaptation, and also a grooming claw. Whereas the haplorines, the higher order primates, are going to have a relatively larger brain size in comparison with the strepsorhines. They do, in fact, have post-orbital closure, which essentially means they have bony material that's completely protecting the orbits, the eye sockets. They have anterior facing orbits, so that term anterior means forward facing, so that enhances their depth perception and ability to be arboreal. They have a fused mandible. They have a shorter snout with a dry nose, so they've lost some moist rhinarium, and they have nails instead of claws on all digits. All right, so let's talk a little bit more in detail about the strepsorhines, also called the prosimians. So in evolutionary terms, they're among the oldest of all of the living primates, and because they're the most primitive, they have retained some of those more primitive characteristics. So like I mentioned before, most primates have an enhanced reliance upon vision and touch, uh, but the strepsorhines have retained that sense of smell. And because of that, there's regions in the brain, the olfactory bulb and the scent gland that are going to be enlarged in comparison with other primates. They have a combination of nails and claws instead of predominantly nails. Because of that, they have slightly less dexterity. Geographically speaking, you're going to find them, lemurs are exclusively on Madagascar, and then the lorises and galagos are found in Southeast Asia. Uh, lemurs, so some examples of primates that we consider strepsorhines, lemurs, various varieties such as ringtailed or black and white rough lemurs, indries and shafakas, lorises, galagos, and pados. All right, so some more physical characteristics. So like I mentioned, relatively smaller brain size in comparison with the haplorines. No post-orbital closure. So you see this ring of bone here, we call that the post-orbital bar. But you can also see that there is a space here. So, you know, not a live, not an alive lemur, of course, but if we were looking at the skull in the classroom, you would be able to stick your pinky finger through there and see the other side of your pinky finger. So no post-orbital enclo enclosure essentially means that there is the post-orbital bar. However, the orbits are not fully enclosed. The orbits also have a slightly more lateral or to the side orientation. Their mandible is not fused. They have a longer snout with a moist rhinarium. They have a tooth comb and they have a grooming claw. All right, so now we're going underneath haplorines. So if we're envisioning our, our taxonomic chart, we're now going underneath haplorines. So the first infra order under haplorines would be the platyrines. So other way to think about platyrines are the New World monkeys. So geographically speaking, we're finding them in South and Central America. Some examples of primates that we consider platyrines would be spider monkeys, squirrel monkeys, capuchins, tamarins, marmosets, howler monkeys, woolly monkeys, sockies, and yukaris. All right, so this slide is talking about the physical characteristics that will help us identify a platyrine. So they have the features that go along with haplorines. So they have enclosed orbits. They do have post-orbital closure and they have anterior facing orbits, eye sockets that face forward. Their nostrils are side directed, or you might see it called you might see it called lateral facing nostrils. Dental formula. So remember from previous chapters when we were doing dental formula, we're dividing the jaw into quarters. So if you're looking at just the mandible, for example, on each half, you would find two incisors, one canine, three premolars, and three molars. So when you're doing dental formula, you're beginning at the front of the mouth and counting to the back. So again, for a New World monkey, it would be two incisors, one canine, three premolars, and three molars. Uh, they do not have a feature called the bony ear tube. They do have a prehensile tail, at least the majority of the platyrines do, but the prehensile tail is only found in platyrines. So remember that term prehensile just means that it has a grasping ability. So if you're at the zoo and you see a primate hanging from a tree by its tail, then you know it must be a platyrine. They do have lower levels of sexual dimorphism. So remembering from previous chapters, that term sexual dimorphism is talking about differences in overall body size and physical attributes of males and females of the same species. 
So with primates, sexual dimorphism is also related to levels of competition. So typically, if you see lower levels of sexual dimorphism, that means lower levels of competition. If you see higher levels of sexual dimorphism, that will mean higher levels of competition for both access to mates and access to food. So because the platyrines have low levels of SD, we'll abbreviate sexual dimorphism SD, they tend to be less competitive in comparison with the catarines and some of the apes. And again, geographically speaking, we find them in natural habitats in both Central and South America. And let's go ahead and pause here and we will continue on in part two.